Today I am donating my body to science and subjecting it to the exercises, diet, and health regimens that are considered optimal for building muscle and performance. So a lot of the information we are getting today is from Mr. Jeff Nippard and Mr. Jeremy Ethier, and we're gonna see by the end of the day if I make any gains. So the first order of business today is finding my calories, of course. So Jeremy Ethier has a formula where it's your body weight multiplied by 15 plus 200 to 400. So for me being 185 pounds, multiplied by 15 gives me 2,775 calories, which I would assume to be my maintenance calories. So now we're gonna add calories to that. So I think I gain fat pretty easily. So I'm gonna go towards the lower side and just add 200 calories, which will give me 2,975 calories. And I'm gonna eat that today, spaced out between four meals, evenly with at least 20 grams of protein, two to four hours apart. So the reason for that was that there was actually a study done where they took two groups of people. The first group had three meals evenly distributed. The second group had only had two meals evenly distributed. And what they found was the group that had three meals gained 30% more muscle. 30% for one extra load, which is a lot more motivating than the typical $20 that I'm slipped. So moral of the story is the science says, have more meals. I am just putting together right now the pre-workout meal that Jeff Nippard says is the most important meal of the day. I took him to be a little bit more of a romantic. I always thought happy wife, happy life, and I'm sure Greg would agree the most important meal is not necessarily an anabolic one. So there's two main reasons for the pre-workout meal. The first one being we're getting carbs to fuel the workout, and then we're also getting protein to create an anabolic environment during training. So I'm gonna put all of the macro guidelines of a pre-workout meal on the screen right now. So my protein and fat source for the day is gonna be some turkey sausages, which is kind of reminding me of that time that I worked a Frats 300 theme party, which is not that fun. And then for the carbs, we got ourselves a sweet potato waffle, which I just whipped up. And then it always said to have a serving of fruit. And I got myself some mango. I'm gonna cover this waffle and some syrup and dive on in before the abandonment issues take over. So I'm gonna go in with all of them at the same time. So a little bit of waffle, a little bit of sausage, and a little bit of mango, and we'll see how that tastes. Kind of an odd combination. I like it, or I just like to eat. I don't know which one. Sausage is just sausage. I mean, I, whenever I feel down, I just gravitate towards it. Very, very good. And there's like this cumin that I added to the sweet potato that is just delicious. Um, I have been skimping on the mango, man. Very juicy. I tell you what, the taste of this waffle, this turkey's gonna have some competition for prime white meat real estate pretty soon. So, this meal is supposed to create peak anabolic environment going into training, and at least part of me is rising to the occasion. So a pre-workout meal is typically eaten one hour to one and a half hours before training. So I was watching an Andrew Huberman podcast and he actually said that based on body temperature rhythms and cortisol release times, the best time to train is 30 minutes, three hours or 11 hours after your normal waking time. So while that could be beneficial to your performance, you gotta really kind of wonder to what extent, how much of a difference will that make? So I always suggest kind of focusing on the science that makes a big difference like your diet and your training. And then the other stuff, focus on that if you actually have the time. So for the workout today, we are actually gonna be following Jeremy Ethier's best push workout science-based. A lot of similarities to Jeff Nippard and some differences that we're gonna talk about throughout the workout. First exercise of the day is three to four sets of six to eight reps on the incline bench press. So we start off with this to focus on the upper chest, which I find interesting because in Jeff Nippard's video, he says there is no upper and lower chest. There's just the pack. So he starts with the bench press to move the most amount of weight the most effectively. So moral of the story is we all read the same studies. It's just all how you interpret it. So I'm gonna do this and then move on to some shoulders. So within the program, there's a range, three to four sets. If you're a beginner, go towards the three sets. If you're more advanced, four sets. When you do dumbbell presses for a long time, coming back to this, it was weird, man. 
The next exercise we are doing is three to four sets, 10 to 15 reps of standing dumbbell shoulder press. So Jeff Nippert also has this in his program and there's an EMG activation study and this one actually has the best EMG activation in comparison to standing barbell, seated barbell and seated dumbbell. So although you can't lift the most amount of weight, if the activation is there, I say go for it. One set, you feel that way more than a barbell, especially the side delt. Crazy. So we're moving back to the chest for exercise number three. We're doing three to four sets, eight to 12 reps, flat demo press with a pause, which makes it a lot harder because you don't have the stretch reflex. You just had to re-engage at the very bottom every single rep and especially after doing shoulders, reduce the weight from what you're used to. If you're somebody who does the flat demo press often like me and you hit a stall and you don't know how to progress, adding in a pause at the bottom of the motion is a great thing to do. So you might have to reduce the weight quite a bit, but once you kind of build back up, once you go back to touch and go, you should be able to break past that plateau. So by adding in kind of little techniques, like a pause, can just help you push past where you might be stuck. Chest pump. You must be wondering, Will, what about the intra workout carbs? Most people out there do not need them, don't worry. I thought I did when I was playing Halo 3, but you don't need them. So the only time you actually need intra workout carbs is if you're training fasted, if you're in a deficit and you're already lean while you're training, or if you're an elite trainee trying to optimize every single detail. But if you still wanna take them, what they do say is that you should take half a gram of carbs for every minute that you train starting at 30 minutes. So we're halfway through our workout right now. We have around 30 minutes left and I get 15 grams of carbs from some BPN G1M Sports. If you wanna pick some up, use code TENNY, link is in the description. Now back to the workout. Back to the shoulders, we are doing two to three sets, 10 to 15 reps of leaning dumbbell lateral raises. So Jeff has it in his program as well, but with the cables, so you're just leaning in the direction of the raise. One up, one. I feel about that one. The last exercise of the day is two to three sets, 10 to 15 reps, uh, incline dumbbell skull crushers, then we head home and make a post-workout meal. Post-workout time. So remember when I said 20 grams of protein was enough to maximize protein synthesis? Well, 40 grams can increase protein synthesis by 20%. No wonder why I noticed extra growth during my stint as a bathroom attendant at Studio 54. We got our fast digesting protein and our fast digesting carbs. So having carbs with your protein post-workout is great for growth hormone production, as opposed to just having the protein alone. So try to shoot for around 25 to 30 grams of carbs post-workout. And then on the side, another serving of fruit, which is great for aiding in digestion and enhancing fluid delivery when combined with other carbs, though the way I enjoy fruit, those enhancements don't require carbs. And then to spice things up a bit and add some flavor, some PB2, and then of course, some Greek yogurt. So make sure not to have just fruit in your post-workout meal because that replenishes liver glycogen, not muscle glycogen. So you always have to combine it with another carb. So just, that's a quick tip for you there. I may only have one father, but the Quaker Oatman is one of my many daddies. Love rice cakes. A bodybuilder staple. Peanut butter and banana, I can't think of a better duo. So you gotta be very careful when you eat these because rice cakes can turn into the crumb apocalypse. So gentle bites. I had the time to come home after my workout and put together this post-workout meal. A lot of people probably think from a science perspective, you get to down a, a shake immediately after training. You need to do that if you train fast. If you go first thing in the morning before work with nothing in you, I would recommend to bring a shake with you 
But if you have a pre-workout meal, that is still in your system for the entire workout and after, so you actually have some leeway and some time to come home and actually make something good. So don't think that you have to sprint to your gym bag. You don't need to do that. When we think of optimizing muscle, a lot of us just look at the workouts and the diets, but what about stretching, mobility, stress, and all that stuff? Because if you are injured, you can't train for very long. So mobility is very, very important. So we're gonna be trying one of Jeremy Ethier's 10 minute perfect daily posture routine, 16 million views in one video. So we're gonna try it out, see what it's all about, and you're gonna watch me just miserably fail at stretching yet again. Mobility or like a, a lagging try on haul? I feel like I'm. But I have no mobility. This is actually very disturbing. We're not giving Jeremy that ad revenue. Come on. Damn. So I just did the lower body focused one and it was really good. Way more difficult than you, what you would expect because I'm super stiff and super sore. But these are the things that you gotta do outside of the gym so when you go back to the gym, you feel good, you can actually move weight properly like how it should because if you don't focus on these things, you're gonna be lifting weights till you're 30 and you're gonna be injured and you're not gonna lift again. So always focus on the things that you might not think about. It is dinner time, y'all. So we're making some salmon, which is considered the gateway fish, splashing around the shallow end until you get some real depth. We got some rice going with some spinach and some green peas for some micros. And then we're gonna add some soy sauce to this, as well as some whole eggs, because I'm actually gonna read this off my phone because I could never regurgitate this accurately. But ingesting whole eggs produced 42% greater levels of muscle protein synthesis when compared to ingesting the same amount of protein in egg whites alone. So it's better to have the whole eggs, not the whites. The whites eventually need to be humbled. So we're gonna let this cup down a bit, crack these in, toss it off a little bit of a fried rice situation, and dinner is served. So you wanna have a little well with your rice, and you crack the egg right in the middle. You crack that egg good, there we go, no shell. Salmon, whole eggs are a great source of omega-3s, which is great for muscle repair and muscle growth. It's great for your joints and just so many things in your body, which is why a lot of diets recommend that you have a piece of fatty fish at least once per week. So salmon might be a weird choice for a fried rice, but just like my college dorm twin size bed, any meats allowed in. So let's give it a taste test. I am guilty of having a very low fat diet. I don't eat salmon don't eat a lot of whole eggs or anything really fatty. I stick to the kind of Greek yogurt, egg whites, chicken, turkey, but having these things are super beneficial and don't skip on them. I know they're pretty high in calories for the volume, but health first, right? If I say it, yeah, health first. Meal number four. So consuming 30 to 40 grams of a casein protein before bed can be very advantageous. Our bodies are primed to build muscle two times a day. First time right after your workout and the second time while you sleep. So in my bowl right now, I have a ton of Greek yogurt, which is a slow digesting protein, which might be kind of redundant considering I'm getting protein milk straight from the source later on. But we got around a cup and a half of that. We got some peanut butter to help slow down the digestion even more. I wish you'd help slow down the completion of some other things, if you know what I mean. And then of course, my fruit, pineapple, because I lead by example. So a nice, delicious bowl. It tastes like dessert to me at this point. And this is what I'm gonna wrap up the night with. After living my entire day science-based, I understand that some of these things are considered optimal. However, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna be following them going forward, because I think a lot of this comes down to enjoyment, especially when it comes to your diet and your training, because if you can't stick to it, no matter how optimal it is, is it really that optimal then? You know what I mean? Like if you're not gonna do it and you're doing the best things possible, but you just don't do it because you don't like it, 
what is the point? So you gotta pick and choose what works for you. And as long as you're doing something, it's better than nothing. So that's my opinion on the whole science-based thing. Take what you want from it and apply it to your own routine and just go with that. So I'm gonna wrap it up here. If you guys enjoyed it, make sure to drop it a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see you guys in the next one.